Thank you to SSCP for the invitation to be here. I'm happy to talk with you today about my work, which examines neurodevelopmental mechanisms linking exposure to adversity in childhood to the emergence of psychopathology across development. I always like to start these presentations by being a bit more specific by what I mean by childhood adversity. So I want to give you a few examples of the types of children that we work with in my lab. I'd like you to first imagine Michael. Michael's father has a drinking problem, um, and when he's drinking, he often experiences rage that's um, unpredictable. And in these moments, uh, he often hits Michael, the other children in the family, and Michael's mother. So when we think about the type of environment that Michael is being raised in, it's one that's characterized by unpredictable and uncontrollable threat. Now, in contrast, I'd like you to imagine Sarah. Sarah's being raised by a single mom who struggles with depression. She works two low-wage jobs with irregular schedules to support her family. She has very little time or energy to spend with her kids, and so Sarah spends most of her time with her older siblings or with other teenagers um, in the neighborhood. Um, and Sarah has, um, is being raised in an environment that's relatively safe, but one that's characterized by very limited opportunities for interaction with adults, supervision, um, and low levels of cognitive and social stimulation. But while the experiences of Michael and Sarah might, on their surface, appear to be uncommon or unusual, um, our work has actually suggested that exposure to these kinds of adverse environments early in life is remarkably common among children in the US. So what I'm showing you here are data from a population representative study, um, the National Comorbidity Survey of Adolescents. Um, we did something really simple, which was just to look at the prevalence of exposure to various types of adverse childhood experiences in that survey. Um, different kinds of things ranging from sort of interpersonal loss events, like having a parent die, having your parents get divorced, other types of parental separations. You can sort of think about the current situation of children at the border as an example of that. Uh, indicators of parental maladjustment, so exposure to domestic violence or growing up in a family where you have a parent who struggles with a substance use problem. And then sort of more severe indicators of child maltreatment, like being exposed to abuse or neglect, or growing up in a household where there's chronic poverty. And what you can see is that the prevalence of these sort of individual experiences varies. Um, but on the whole, more than half of kids in this country have experienced at least one of these events by the time they reach adulthood. And this is concerning because we know that exposure to these forms of adversity is a very powerful risk factor for the emergence of psychopathology. So in that same nationally representative sample, we did something very simple, which was just to look at the number of exposures to those different adverse events a child had and look at the association with the likelihood that they developed a, um, an onset of a psychiatric disorder, depression, an anxiety disorder, a behavior problem by the time they reached adulthood. And you see this very strong sort of dose-response relationship between the number of exposures and your likelihood for developing psychopathology such that kids at the highest levels of exposure are nearly four times as likely to develop a mental disorder by the time they reach adulthood as children who have never been exposed to adversity. So that's nearly a 400% increase in the risk for psychopathology. Um, and what we know is that this risk is not just evident in childhood and adolescence, but it persists across the life course. So what you can see in this slide is um, something that epidemiologists call a population attributable risk proportion, which is a big mouthful. All it means is sort of proportion of variance explained in the population, essentially. So what proportion of a disease or mental health problem is explained by a particular exposure? So to put these numbers in context, the proportion of cardiovascular disease in the United States that's explained by cigarette smoking is about 20%. What I'm showing you on this slide is the proportion of all mental disorders that begin at various stages of the life course in the United States that are explained by exposure to those adverse childhood experiences I showed you just a few slides ago. And these numbers are striking. We see that nearly half of all mental disorders that begin in childhood in this country are attributable to exposure to adversity, about one third of mental disorders that start during adolescence. But strikingly, we see that about one in four mental health problems that start in adulthood um, are attributable to exposure to adversity in childhood. And these are in models that actually even control for whether you had a mental disorder as a child, um, suggesting that the effects of these experiences persist throughout the life course. So what explains this relationship? Why are experiences of adversity in childhood such powerful predictors of psychopathology, and what are the mechanisms that explain that relationship? Um, this is the question that we focus on in, in my lab. And it's not a new question. This is actually something that people have been interested in for a long time. 
Um, and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit is about the sort of initial approach that people in the field took um, to studying adverse childhood experiences and their long-term impact. Um, so the initial approach to doing this was to kind of study these adversities one at a time. So if you look into the literature, you'll find kind of over the past few decades an entire literature about kids who are exposed to domestic violence and an entire separate literature about kids who were exposed to sexual abuse. So these kind of individual lines of research about studying adversities one at a time. Um, but there's a big problem with this approach which is that these adversities cluster and they co-occur, right? So these are data from that same nationally representative survey. Um, all, the way to interpret this figure is just find, find an adversity type, and then what you can see is the average number of additional adversities a child experienced, on average, who, are, who was exposed to that. So if you're exposed to neglect, for example, on average you've experienced four other types of adversities. Now, of course, this raises serious validity issues for studying these experiences one at a time, because let's imagine you find an association between sexual abuse and depression, but you haven't measured any other kind of adversity a child's experienced. How do you know if it's actually the sexual abuse that's causing that association or the you know, three or four other kinds of adversity that child has experienced? And so this recognition about the co-occurrence of adversity exposures really led to a shift in the field um, to what is now sort of the prevailing approach, which I'm going to call the ACEs approach. Um, alternatively, people have called this the cumulative risk approach. And essentially, this approach involves simply counting up the number of adversities a child has experienced and associating that number with um, you know, some type of health outcome. So you, you can find you know, literally hundreds of papers now showing you this kind of association. In fact, I just showed you this association a few slides ago, the association between adversity and, and mental health. Um, but what's interesting is that people started using the same approach to not only study the link between adversities and downstream health outcomes, um, but to also try to study the mechanisms linking adversity with those health outcomes. Um, and what I'm going to argue today is that this approach oversimplifies the boundaries between distinct types of environmental experiences. Um, and the, the implicit problem with this approach is that what it assumes is that the environment that Michael is growing up in, that's characterized by unpredictable and uncontrollable threat, is going to influence his development in exactly the same way and through the same mechanisms as the environment that Sarah is being raised in, which is completely safe, but characterized by a lack of cognitive and social stimulation. Um, now, just to make this a little bit more clear, this is legitimately what the ACEs or cumulative risk approach would advocate. They would say, take a child's life, count up the number of sort of adverse things that have happened. So this child's had exposure to physical abuse and domestic violence, and he lives in a neighborhood where there's violence. He gets a risk score of three. And let's look at Sarah's experience. She's got a mom who struggles with depression. She's been exposed to emotional neglect, and she lives in chronic poverty. She has a risk score of three. In the prevailing approach, these experiences are completely equivalent in terms of how we think of the neurodevelopmental mechanisms that might link these experiences with downstream health outcomes. And what I'm going to argue today um, is that the mechanisms that link these different types of adverse early environments to the emergence of psychopathology may be at least partially distinct. Um, the approach that we've taken in my lab and the sort of model that I'm going to talk about today has really taken a different approach to thinking about how particular types of environmental experiences might shape the way the brain is developing um, and shape sort of early learning in specific ways that may um, vary across the different types of environments that we currently classify as sort of adversity. Um, and the model that I'm going to talk to you about today is summarized in this figure. Um, this is a, a model I developed with my colleague Margaret Sheridan, um, which is really an alternative to these first two approaches that I've just described that attempts to distill sort of complex adverse experiences into core underlying dimensions that cut across multiple forms of adversity, but that we think will have similar effects um, on developmental outcomes. Um, in other words, this, uh, this approach is trying to identify what are the active ingredients in environmental experiences that shape the way the brain is developing and shape early forms of learning in ways that might be distinct. Um, so this slide depicts our initial model where we've identified two dimensions that we think are um, likely having at least somewhat different effects on children's development. Um, the first dimension is threat. These are experiences that involve harm or threat of harm to the child, um, different forms of exposure to violence, for example. Um, and the other dimension is what we call deprivation. So this is um, sort of a dimension that captures an absence of some type of expected experience that the brain is sort of expecting from the environment. So when we're born, we're, you know, there are many things that 
um, that develop in an experience expectant fashion. Our brain is waiting to get input from the environment um, in order to sort out what kind of environment we're developing in and to build the neural scaffolding to sort of adapt to that environment. And so what we argue is that different forms of adversity actually reflect an absence of some type of expected experience, either social, cognitive, or emotional. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today are the sort of predictions we make about how these different aspects of early experience are likely to shape children's development and some of the data that we've sort of accumulated thus far about whether there are in fact different mechanisms linking these distinct types of experiences with um, downstream mental health outcomes. So I'm going to talk to you first about the dimension of threat. So um, as I mentioned, this dimension um, essentially reflects experiences that involve harm or threat of harm to the child, essentially exposure to violence. So whether it's um, direct abuse or living in a house where there's violence between your caregivers or even living in a violent neighborhood where you've observed violence happening to other people. Um, and we make a very simple prediction, which is that growing up in an environment that is threatening is going to alter the way that systems in the brain that were designed to identify threats learn about them and mobilize behavioral responses to keep you safe are developing um, in ways that are going to facilitate sort of the rapid identification of threat in your environment. And what I want to highlight actually right from the beginning is that we think this is an adaptive response to growing up in a violent or dangerous environment. Um, and so the predictions we make are that growing up in a threatening context is going to have primary influences on systems in the brain that are involved in fear learning learning how to detect what predicts threat in the environment, and mobilizing responses to that. So typically networks that we call involved in salience processing, identifying important cues to pay attention to in the environment. Um, these are systems that are you know, centrally involved the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so this is just sort of a very simple model um, that we've developed of sort of some of the mechanisms that we think um, link experiences of, I'm going to use the word trauma interchangeably with sort of threat. Um, with downstream psychopathology outcomes. I'm not going to talk about this today. This is sort of factors that might promote resilience, but I'd be happy to um, answer questions about that at the end. And so what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about some of these mechanisms in the domains of information processing, emotional reactivity, as well as emotional learning and emotion regulation that we think serve as core mechanisms linking early experiences of trauma to the emergence of psychopathology. So I'm going to really briefly touch on information processing biases. This is largely work that's not collected in my lab, but sort of provided us some of the inspiration and early pieces of evidence um, for, for some of the ideas that I'm going to present to you today. Um, and much of this work was done um, by Seth Pollack, who's really a pioneer in this area, um, as well as Ken Dodge. And, and what they showed, have shown repeatedly is that kids who grow up in dangerous environments who are exposed to trauma exhibit changes in the way they process information, social information, um, in ways that really facilitate the rapid identification of threat. And this is, I'm going to give you three examples of the kinds of um, evidence that, um, that suggests the sort of heightened threat processing. So, you know, the first is if you show, um, if you show children faces that are initially neutral and that slowly morph into a different emotional expression, kids who've been exposed to violence can identify anger with less perceptual information um, than children who have never been exposed to violence. So they see that anger more quickly, right? And anger is a really good sign that something could be dangerous in your environment, right? It's a very potent predictor that there could be something threatening um, uh, in your environment. Now, the second piece of evidence, and this has been very well replicated, so if you give kids a, a dot probe task or a task that's designed to measure attention, um, what you see is that when that probe appears behind the angry face, um, children who've been exposed to violence respond much more quickly um, when it's behind the angry face relative to the neutral face than children who have never experienced violence, which suggests that their attention is captured kind of this bottom-up way by cues that, um, that could signify the, the presence of threat in the environment. Um, and then in work that um, has mostly been led by Ken Dodge's lab, we also see that when you, you present children with sort of socially ambiguous situations, like imagine you're on the playground and somebody hits you in the back with a kickball, um, why do you think that happened? Kids who've been exposed to violence are much more likely to say somebody was trying to hurt me um, than it was an accident. Kids who have not been exposed to viol are violence are much more likely to say that was an accident. Um, so you see this sort of bias in how kids are making sense of the social world um, in the sense that they are sort of seeing threat in places where it might not exist. Okay, so we know from a long history of research that kids exposed to threatening early environments exhibit these kind of biases in information processing that help them to identify threat very rapidly in the environment. So in addition, we've consistently observed that when there are sort of negative or threatening cues in the environment, 
um, there's a much larger sort of emotional response um, to those cues in children who have experienced violence. Um, so we've shown this um, in simple ways using tasks that use like IAPS pictures like what I'm showing you here where we'll simply vary the sort of emotional content of the images that children are, are viewing, either um, showing them pictures that are negative or people are expressing negative emotions, um, positive, or images that are totally neutral. Um, and what we see across a range of studies, this has been replicated in, in other labs as well, is that um, kids who have been exposed to trauma exhibit much stronger responses in the amygdala which is a sort of key node in the, what we call the salience network, a, re, a set of brain regions that essentially responds to cues in the environment that are motivationally salient, things that we should pay attention to because they have relevance for our goals. And for most of us, survival is a pretty important goal. It's probably the most important goal, right? So when there's a threat around that is you know, potentially highly salient. So without doing too much reverse inference, one way that we can sort of interpret this pattern is that when there's a negative cue in the environment, um, something that could signify the presence of a threat, this sort of system in the brain that's responsible for sort of identifying those important cues and mobilizing a behavioral response has a much stronger response in kids who have been exposed to trauma than kids who have not. And what you're going to see sometimes in my talk are these pictures that appear at the top. Um, these are the uh, amazing students and postdocs in my lab who have done you know, the vast majority of the work that I'm talking with you about um, today. So giving a shout out to and giving credit where credit is due to all the amazing folks who did this work. Um, so we see these sort of higher amygdala reactivity to threat. Um, but we don't see differences just in the amygdala. So everyone kind of loves the amygdala. It's a brain area. It's easy to sort of think about um, and what it means. Um, but what's interesting is we now see across a number of studies and different tasks that um, we not only see this sort of heightened response in the salience network to negative emotional cues, but we get reductions in activation sort of throughout this frontoparietal control network. Um, this is a, a set of brain regions that's sort of tends to be implicated in cognitive control and executive functions, but in the emotional domain, we actually see um, in tasks I'm not going to talk about today, but when we ask kids, for example, to engage in cognitive reappraisal in the scanner to sort of recruit this network to modulate their emotions, um, you see this, this set of brain regions get recruited for sort of modulating responses to emotional cues as well. So while we don't know exactly what this pattern actually means, one way that we've thought to interpret it is that kids who haven't been exposed to trauma are sort of naturally sort of recruiting these regions of the brain that are involved in emotion regulation when you show them things that are aversive or negative. Um, and kids who have never been exposed to trauma are sort of naturally not recruiting those emotion regulation circuits when they're viewing um, when they're viewing negative images. And you could think about that might be adaptive if you're growing up in a dangerous environment where that bottom-up signal might be really important to pay attention to. You might not necessarily want to sort of modulate that signal if it's providing an important clue about something dangerous in the environment. We've actually replicated this in a different kind of emotional processing task, um, uh, you know, simple task where you show kids fearful faces relative to neutral faces. Um, we find exactly the same pattern. Or sorry, blue, everything that's colored in blue means there's lower activity in that area and the kids who have been exposed to trauma relative to controls. And so we see this kind of ar across a range of emotional processing tasks, not just this heightened salience network response, but also lower response in these brain regions that are sort of canonically involved in cognitive control, including the cognitive control of emotion. Um, okay, so what, do all, what does all this brain data have to do with psychopathology? That's kind of where we started, right? So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how these sort of brain patterns that we think are likely helping children adapt to the environments in which they're developing um, might also come at a cost in the long term by increasing their risk for developing psychopathology. So um, one piece of data I'm going to show you is sort of this really interesting and I don't want to use the, the word fortuitous because it was a horrible event, but sort of unexpected opportunity that we had to examine how these patterns of brain activity that we were observing um, in the scanner might actually predict real world um, psychopathology, which is um, in the first study we, we ever did looking at the sort of amygdala reactivity in kids who've been exposed to trauma, we were sort of midway through scanning um, and a terrorist attack happened in Boston. So. Many of you probably remember this. There were two pressure cooker bombs detonated at the finish line of the marathon. Several people were killed. Many more were injured. Um, and although exposure directly to this event was sort of limited to people who were standing at the finish line, um, the city of Boston for the ensuing week 
was really an environment which you could describe as one of heightened threat. So the entire Back Bay neighborhood was roped off as a crime scene. Um, there were National Guard stationed throughout the public transportation system. There was widespread speculation in the media that there were additional bombs in the city, including at Fenway Park and at JFK Library. Uh, and then several days after the bombing, the FBI released photographs of the perpetrators, which led to really this unprecedented lockdown of the entire city of Boston on a weekday. Every school was closed, the public transportation system was closed, everyone was essentially indoors, glued to CNN, watching this sort of high-speed chase for the perpetrators unfold through um, wat the Watertown and Cambridge neighborhoods. Um, and what we learned in 9-11 is that exposure to these kinds of mass trauma um, or terrorist attacks through the media is sufficient to trigger symptoms of PTSD as well as depression and anxiety, especially in children. And so what we were curious about is whether the patterns of brain response that kids had exhibited in this study that we are sort of midway through collecting data for predicted which of them would develop symptoms of PTSD to this totally exogenous stressor that happened in their lives. Um, and what we found, now this is a very small sample, but what I'll say is it's now been replicated at least three times in bigger samples, is that the degree to which you recruited um, your amygdala to those negative relative to neutral cues in the scanner, um, the more likely you were to develop PTSD symptoms specifically in relation to this terrorist attack. And this is after controlling for your prior exposure to trauma, your prior psychopathology, and many other things the reviewers wanted us to control for in this paper. This is a very robust effect that's now been replicated in two military samples. So in Israel, before people, um, you know, many people um, do a year of military service, and they've done imaging studies now where they look at their sort of um, neural responses to emotional cues before they experience that military service, where many of them will experience trauma, and have replicated this effect in several samples, as well as an adult civilian sample collected in Atlanta by Carrie Ressler group. So this sort of effect is now fairly consistent that the more you're recruiting these salience network regions in response to aversive cues, while that might keep you safe in the short term and help you adapt to a dangerous environment, it may come at a long-term cost in terms of increasing your risk for psychopathology, particularly in the context of additional stressors. Um, and we see it's not just the amygdala, but these patterns of brain response we see um, in the frontal parietal network also seem to mediate or explain the relationship between trauma and the emergence of psychopathology. So in um, two separate um, samples in my lab, we've now shown that this sort of relationship between exposure to trauma and reduced recruitment in the frontal parietal network um, in response to emotional cues, as well as heightened response in the salience network in this kind of whole brain, whole brain mediation analysis that I'm happy to talk about um, later, that where we use Tor Wager's um, mediation toolbox. What we see is that these patterns of brain activity mediate the relationship between <laughs> trauma and the emergence of psychopathology transdiagnostically. So um, this sort of general psychopathology or P factor, which I'm happy to talk about, sort of been an interesting topic in clinical psychology of late, um, simply reflects sort of the, the shared variance across many forms of psychopathology, both internalizing and externalizing. Um, but what we see is that these these brain patterns um, predict not only concurrently, but two years later, um, and mediate the relationship between trauma exposure and this sort of transdiagnostic risk for psychopathology. So these patterns of brain activity seem to have relevance um, for mental health. Okay, so um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about in relation to trauma, we see that you know kids who have been exposed to violence um, identify threat rapidly in the environment. They mobilize large responses to that threat. Um, I'm going to talk last about um, what we know about how children come to learn about what predicts threat in the environment. So what are the cues that help them discriminate or figure out which, are, which things in the environment are safe and dangerous? Um, so I'm going to show you two experiments, one outside the scanner and one in the scanner, where we use very simple aversive learning paradigms. So um, it's actually pretty tough to study aversive learning in kids. So, you know, in adults, um, typically these kinds of experiments use shock as an unconditioned stimulus. Um, for very obvious reasons, we don't shock children in my lab, so it's, it can be kind of tough to develop aversive learning experiments that are sufficiently aversive to get uh, that kids will complete the experiment but also exhibit learning. Um, so the, in this experiment, we used a task that was developed in Danny Pine's lab that um, just uses um, simple yellow and blue colored bells as the conditioned stimuli. Um, one of those bells is associated with a very loud kind of aversive noise, almost sort of like nails on a chalkboard um, during the learning phase. And then in an extinction phase, the cues are presented again in the absence of any unconditioned stimulus. And so in this experiment, we were just using skin conductance as the outcome measure, which is sort of a, the classic measure of um, sort of fear response. 
Um, and what you see is in the kids without trauma, exactly the pattern that you would expect. So um, early in the first phase of learning, um, you get this very clear discrimination in skin conductance responses to the threat cue relative to the cue that predicts safety. Um, that response habituates over time. So even during the active learning phase, you see this kind of habituation. And then it washes out entirely during the extinction phase. Um, so something I always like to ask people before I show you what we actually found is what, what you might expect among kids exposed to trauma. Because I'll give you a preview. Our hypothesis was totally unsupported in terms of what, what we expected um, to see among the kids exposed to trauma. So given what I've already told you, what would you expect to see among kids who'd been exposed to violence in terms of how they learn to discriminate about what predicts threat and safety in the environment? Who's brave? Who's willing to make a prediction? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, that's what we thought. They'd learn more quickly and that they, that, that they would sort of persist. This fear response wouldn't extinguish as quickly, that it would sort of remain heightened over time. They're going to hang on to that information more. Um, I always like to tell trainees that I think you learn the most in science when your hypotheses are not supported. So don't be afraid of being wrong. It's actually like when you learn the most. And so we see something completely different. Um, what we actually said, there are two things that I think are interesting about this pattern. The first is that you see this sort of remarkably blunted skin conductance response in the kids who have been exposed to trauma, and this kind of replicates a lot of work um, using stress paradigms and the trio social stress test, where you just generally see lower sympathetic nervous system responses as well as HPA access responses in kids who have been exposed to trauma. I'm not going to talk about that because the pattern I think is more interesting, but I'm happy to answer questions about it, um, is that what you see here during this early phase of learning, when you should expect the biggest discrimination between the threat and safety cue, is that they're not discriminating at all. In fact, they're exhibiting just as large a response to the cue that predicts a th um, safety as to the cue that predicts threat. Um, now, what does this mean? We're still trying to figure this out, um, but one way you could interpret this is that you know, when you put kids in, who have experienced a lot of violence and, and legitimate threats in their environment in a context where something threatening is happening, um, they could be paying attention to sort of a broader set of stimulus features than kids who have never ex been exposed to violence. So rather than thinking it's the yellow bell that's dangerous, it's like bells are dangerous, right? This context is dangerous. There's, there's, there's threat around. It makes it hard for them to hone in on the specific aspects of those stimuli um, that are actually predictive of the threat. Um, or it could be a potentially a generalization response, um, which is something we're following up on right now. Um, but before we sort of overinterpreted this initial finding, we tried to replicate it um, in an imaging task because skin conductance is kind of a funky measure. There's lots of people who just don't have a skin conductance response. It's you know not a perfect measure. What we really want to know is what's going on in the amygdala, which is where we know that from rodent models, this binding of the previously neutral cue with the aversive stimulus happens. So um, we repeated um, this this study. This is a task that was actually developed in Nim Tottenham's lab. Um, we modified it just a little bit, but essentially it's the same kind of task where kids are seeing neutral um, shapes, um, one of which is associated with that same sort of loud, aversive, um, unconditioned stimulus, and one of which is not. Um, and just um, for the purposes of describing the analysis, um, this is a block design um, that we did in the scanner. We're only going to be analyzing the trials that were not where the, they're not contaminated by the unconditioned stimulus. You're really just looking at their response to the cue that predicts the threat happening relative to the cue that predicts safety. Um, OK, so just real briefly before I show you the group differences, I just want to show you what we see just in general in terms of the patterns of brain activity in this contrast. So um, when kids are um, looking at a cue that predicts threat relative to safety, you see sort of the canonical sa salience network um, emerge. This is um, very consistent with adult studies of fear conditioning. We get um, response in the amygdala, especially the right amygdala, the interior insula, um, the dorsal ACC, and the sort of wide swath of dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and what's important is just like in the skin conductance data I showed you, um, when we do a, a parametric modulation analysis, which is just looking at how these brain responses are changing over time during learning, um, you see the same habituation pattern that I showed you in the skin conductance data. So these are regions of the brain that respond really strongly to the threat cue, but they linearly kind of decrease over time. So even during active learning, you see this kind of habituation to threat um, all throughout the salience network. Um, okay, so what do we see, um, oh, and just briefly, we see a very different set of brain regions that get recruited um, in response to the safety cue, including the hippocampus, and um, traditionally people see regions more in the default mode network um, emerge in this contrast, regions like the um, posterior cingulate and the precuneus. Um, so 
what do we see? Um, I'm going to focus just on the right amygdala, which, as I mentioned, is sort of the region that we know from animal models is where this associative binding of the unconditioned stimulus with a previously neutral cue occurs. Um, but we see the same pattern sort of throughout the salience network. Um, when we look at this region of the brain, um, what we see first is that, similar to our skin conductance data, the kids who are exposed to trauma are exhibiting a blunted response to the threat cue. They're also exhibiting poor discrimination between the threat and safety cue, where you see this sort of large discrimination here in the kids who have never experienced trauma during the early learning phase. We see less discrimination here. And when we look across the entire paradigm, um, what we see is this sort of strong habituation over time in kids who have never ex been exposed to trauma, um, and this sort of blunted habituation over time in kids who, who have experienced trauma. So we really kind of replicate the same pattern that we see in our skin conductance data, which is that you know, they're really having a hard time discriminating what predicts threat and what predicts safety. And the final thing I'll show you is we were kind of curious about, you know, not just amygdala activation, but what other regions of the brain are sort of functionally coupling with the amygdala during this, um, this type of learning. Um, and what we see in a whole brain analysis is actually that kids who are exposed to trauma have less functional connectivity between the right amygdala um, and the hippocampus, which is a region that is sort of tends to be recruited in response to the safety cue. It's involved in sort of contextual modulation of um, these associations and helps to kind of inhibit amygdala responses during the task. Um, and the way we've sort of interpreted this is you're getting sort of less um, functional coupling between the salience network and the sort of other um, network of regions that primarily involves the default mode network that we know is sort of involved in safety signaling or sort of learning about which cues predict sa um, safety. Um, and this sort of pattern of poor functional connectivity between or lower functional connectivity between these regions is very strongly associated with psychopathology in these kids. Um, so what I'm showing you is psychopathology. Um, now, before I transition to the part of my talk where I'm going to talk to you about deprivation, I sort of started with this argument that the, um, that different aspects of environmental experience might have different neurodevelopmental consequences. So all that I showed you is well and good, but is it specific to exposure to threat? And I'm going to show you just a little bit of data to suggest that it is. So um, the first thing I'm going to show you is a study that in many of the studies I just showed you were um, samples that we recruited specifically to include kids who had been exposed to trauma. Um, so what we did in this particular study was recruit a large sample where we had variability in exposure to trauma as well as exposure to deprivation. The kids weren't specific specifically included because they had a lot of trauma exposure. Um, and our model is a dimensional one where we really think about these experiences as existing across a dimension of threat and deprivation, and that when we measure them continuously and put them both in the same model, we expect specificity to emerge. And that's exactly what we see in this study. This is neural responses to a simple task um, looking at fearful versus neutral faces. Um, the areas that you see in red are regions of the brain that were positively associated with exposure to threat. So we see our old friend, the amygdala, as well as other regions in the salience network, the interior insula, um, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and that's controlling for their exposure to deprivation, which is shown in blue, where we see no associations whatsoever in the salience network. Instead, we see actually elevated activity in some regions of the frontal parietal network. OK, um, but don't take my word for it. These are studies that were done in my lab designed to test these questions. So we recently completed a systematic review of every neuroimaging study that's ever been done on kids exposed to adversity um, and looked at how um, exposure to studies that uh, recruited kids exposed to threat relative to deprivation or in samples where there were mixed exposure. So they like combined kids with abuse and neglect get together as one sort of maltreated group. Um, and what you see is that there's remarkable specificity in the literature between exposure to violence and this sort of heightened pattern of amygdala reactivity, where the majority of studies of children exposed to threat observe this pattern. Um, a minority of studies of kids exposed to deprivation find this pattern. And really, the findings are kind of all over the place in samples with mixed exposures, which I would suggest reflects the fact that they're mixing apples and oranges here, that they're taking fundamentally different types of experiences and collapsing them into a single group. Um, the final specificity piece I'll show you is with regard to fear learning. So just as a reminder, this is the pattern of learning we see among kids exposed to trauma. We took the exact same fear conditioning task and administered in a sample of kids who have grown up in extremely deprived orphanages in Romania. Um, it's a study I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more in just a second. But these are kids exposed to very extreme early life deprivation. 
Um, in that same identical task, this is the pattern that you see in kids who were exposed to that early form of deprivation. This looks no different than the control subjects in that study who were raised in, in families in their environment, suggesting that this sort of pattern of changes in aversive learning is really specific to an environment characterized by threat. And even a very extreme adverse environment that's characterized by deprivation is not having a similar effect on this pattern of, of learning. Um, so to sum up kind of this first part of the talk, what I've shown you is that kids who have experienced violence in their early environment have changes in social and emotional processing across a range of domains, uh, particularly in response to cues that are negative or that could sort of pretend, you know, the presence of threat in the environment. We see this in the domains of social information processing, um, amygdala and salience network responses to aversive cues, um, difficulty with discriminating cues that predict threat and safety. And I don't have time to talk with you about this today, but we've also seen this very consistent consistently in my lab and in many other labs that they also have problems or difficulties with sort of modulating or regulating those sort of emotional responses to threatening cues. And that we generally don't observe these patterns among kids who have experienced deprivation, particularly when we control for co-occurring exposure to threat. Okay, so let me transition, and for the rest of the time, I'm going to um, talk to you about some of our work on deprivation. So um, in contrast to threat, which we argue involves the presence of a really specific type of learning, learning about something um, dangerous that's happening in your environment, deprivation involves instead the absence of some type of experience that your brain is expecting um, early, in, early in life. Many aspects of brain development are experience expectant, meaning that input from the environment is actually required for the system to develop normally. Um, simplest demonstration of this principle can be seen in sensory systems, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, um, using the visual system as, a, as an example. Um, but there are many other types of inputs that our brain expects to experience early in development, like the presence of a sensitive and responsive caregiver. Um, and children who are neglected, children who are raised in institutions, um, and some children who are raised in situations of material deprivation, though not all, um, experience um, deprivation in these sort of expected inputs. Um, and the simple argument that we make is because the brain requires input from the environment to develop normally, when those expected inputs are absent, um, the connections that are designed to process those inputs are eliminated through a very normal developmental process called synaptic pruning. Um, this is a way that our brain becomes more efficient and becomes adapted to the environment in which we're developing. Um, it's a very simple idea. So what you see here um, are patterns of synaptic density in human prefrontal cortex based on postmortem studies. There's a pattern I'm sure you're all very familiar with, which is that early in life, there's this kind of proliferation of, of connections. Uh, between neurons um, that for the rest of our life are, are being pruned away. Um, and pruning is a very normal developmental process that is sort of getting rid of connections that are inefficient, that are underutilized, um, which is helping our brain adapt to the environment in which it's developing. Um, so what we argue is that ex exposure to deprivation can kind of hijack this normal developmental process of synaptic pruning getting rid of connections that we might actually need later when the inputs from the environment are absent early in life. Um, and a simple demonstration of this principle can be seen in sensory systems. So um, if you um, deprive animals, for example, a visual input early in life, let's say you put a blindfold on a kitten, this is actually something that people have done in experiments, is um, raise kittens in uh, what they call dark rearing, so there's no light input to the retina. What you see is a dramatic reduction in the number of synapses in primary visual cortex. Your brain is getting rid of the connections that are not being utilized. Um, we see that same pattern replicated in, in humans exposed to early visual deprivation due to congenital blindness. Relative to individuals who become blind later in life, you see a dramatic reduction in the thickness of primary visual cortex, um, which of course we, we, we can't know for sure um, the molecular processes that underlie that in humans, but we can make an assumption that it's a similar process of sort of exaggerated synapse elimination um, in regions that are not um, receiving the input that they expect from the environment and are not being utilized. So, okay. Um, so the argument that we make is that when a child is raised in a um, socially and cognitively deprived environment, um, you're going to many of the sort of connections between neurons that normally would be recruited when that child listens to complex language, interacts with stimuli in the environment that are brought to their attention by a caregiver, um, many of these connections that aren't being utilized are going to get eliminated perhaps too early and perhaps in too extreme a fashion. Um, although it's sort of in response to the um, complexity of the environment that that child is developing in. The brain is saying, I'm not using this connection.
connection, I'm going to get rid of it. I don't need it. And that over sort of a long period of time, that this can lead, um, when it happens in a dramatic fashion, to actual thinning in the cortex that happens early, um, particularly in regions of the brain that process the kinds of complex social and cognitive inputs that are lacking in, a, in an environment that's deprived of sort of consistent and stable caregiving. Um, so what evidence do we have for this idea? Um, I'm going to start with some data. So if this hypothesis is true, we should see it um, most clearly in kids who are exposed to a really extreme form of deprivation. So I'm going to talk to you about um, kids who are raised in um, extremely deprived orphanage settings um, that come from this sort of longitudinal study that you may be familiar with called the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. Um, this is a study that's led by Chuck Nelson, Charlie Zena, and Nathan Fox um, that started with a sample of kids who were being raised in horrifically deprived orphanages in, in Bucharest, Romania. Um, when those kids were in infancy, and sort of early toddler period, half of them were randomized to a foster care intervention um, where they were removed from these institutions and placed in a family. I'm not going to talk very much about that intervention, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, and then there was a control group of kids who were growing up in families in the, in the neighborhoods surrounding these orphanages. Um, and I became involved in the study as a postdoc um, right when they were collecting their first wave of, um, of neuroimaging data using MRI when the kids were 8 to 10 years old. Um, and I just briefly first want to comment on the nature of this sort of um, deprivation in these, in these institutions. So at least in these institutions in Romania, orphanages vary a lot. These particular institutions um, were characterized by extreme isolation. So for the first couple years of life, kids essentially are placed in a crib by themselves, very little contact with adults. Um, very little contact with their peers. They, they have no opportunity to form selective attachments. Um, there's a sort of lack of psychological investment by the caregivers who take care of these kids. So the number of children to adults is extremely high, typically on the order of 12 to 15, even in infancy. And, they, and the workers in these institutions were kept on rotating shifts so that they weren't caring for the same kids every day. Again, sort of preventing the opportunity for selective attachments with particular caregivers. Um, and I would also sort of argue that this is an environment characterized by extremely low cognitive complexity. So the kids are not hearing language. Um, their life is highly routinized. You can sort of see this um, heartbreakingly depicted in this image where you know the kids are not only kind of eating their meals at the same time every day, going through the same routine every day, they're even sort of forced to go to the bathroom all at the same time every day. So there's absolutely no individualized care um, provided for, for specific children. So an, ext an extreme example of deprivation. So what does this kind of experience do to the brain? Um, just in terms of cortical structure, um, in an early paper, we simply looked at the amount of cortical gray matter um, in kids who are growing up in these institutions, which you see in these two groups here, relative to kids in the community. And what you see is um, a dramatic reduction in cortical gray matter um, among kids growing up in these institutions that we then sort of followed up with a more specific question using sort of very conservative whole brain tests of changes in cortical thickness, which is a you know, metric that we can, use, that we can measure um, using MRI that we think is a slightly better sort of indicator um, of synaptic pruning. And what you see here in blue are all of the regions in the brain that are significantly thinner um, and the kids who are raised in those institutions relative to the community. Um, and what you see is that this, this sort of accelerated or exaggerated cortical thinning is happening in a wide range of regions that process complex social and cognitive inputs, including regions that, are, um, that process language input, um, regions of the frontoparietal network that are involved in attention and working memory, um, and uh, as well as regions that are um, sort of implicated in social, cogn social cognition, theory of mind. Um, and we were sort of curious about whether um, these patterns of cortical thinning had any relevance for the sort of downstream um, outcomes, mental health outcomes in these kids. And one outcome that we were particularly interested in was ADHD. Um, we were interested in it for a few reasons. The first is that um, not only in this particular study, but in most studies of kids raised in deprived orphanages, like in Michael's Rudder Michael Rudder's data, you see the same pattern. You see this very high level of ADHD, symptom, ADHD diagnoses in these kids, like four to five times higher um, than kids who are being raised in families in the community. Um, we were also curious about ADHD because this pattern of accelerated thinning or exaggerated thinning that we observed in these kids um, was in similar regions where you see exaggerated cortical thinning in kids who have ADHD. 
ADHD. So we were curious about whether the, the, this, um, this elevation in symptoms of ADHD might be explained by these sort of differences in, um, in neurodevelopment. And so we did this sort of mediation analysis where we looked at the relationship between early deprivation um, and symptoms of inattention and asked how much of this relationship can we explain by this sort of pattern of exaggerated cortical thinning. And it turns out you can explain more than two thirds, nearly two thirds of this relationship um, when you take into account these patterns of brain development. Um, and when we look at symptoms of hyperactivity, um, we explain even more of that association. And you know, what that means is that in theory, if we could sort of either prevent this deprivation from happening um, or in some way prevent the neurodevelopmental consequences of it, you could reduce in theory symptoms of ADHD in this group by more than 80%. Um, now, most kids in the US are not exposed to deprivation that, that's that extreme. So what I'm going to end on is sort of um, an exposure that's quite common here in this country um, that's not as extreme as growing up in an orphanage where no one talks to you or pays any attention to you, um, but that I argue um, in many ways confers risk for similar types of deprivation that are less extreme but still significant um, for how children are developing. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, about poverty. So we know that um, about 20% of kids in the US grow up in a family that's below the poverty line, which um, for a family of four is about $24,000 a year, um, more than in any other developed country in the world. Um, and we know that growing up in a family where um, your parents um, either have low income or low levels of education is not inherently associated with deprivation, but it's a risk factor for many forms of deprivation, including exposure to complex language, which I'm going to show you some data on in just a moment, um, consistent access to food and shelter, to enriching cognitive experiences at home and in school, supervision by adults, consistent rules and routines, and that determines the complexity of children's early environment. What's interesting, this is not data from my lab. This is data from Allison Mackey's lab. I could have shown you data from Kim Noble's lab that looks exactly the same, is that when you look at patterns of cortical thickness in kids who are as a function of socioeconomic status, you see a map that looks remarkably similar to the one that I just showed you among kids growing up in deprived orphanages. Now, these blobs are bigger just because of differences in the um, correction for multiple comparisons in the whole brain, but the regions of the brain um, that you see here in red and yellow are all regions that are lower, uh, thinner rather, in kids who are growing up in low SES households um, than kids who are growing up in higher SES households. And you see this thinning sort of in many of the same regions of the brain that you saw in kids who are growing up in those deprived orphanages. Um, and so we've been leading some work in my lab to sort of look at the role that early cognitive simulation in the environment uh, that varies as a function of SES might play both in determining those patterns of cortical thickness as well as aspects of cognitive development that we know are relevant for ADHD, which I talked about earlier, and that are strongly related to some of the brain regions where we most consistently see these patterns of thinning, like, like the frontoparietal network. Um, we know as well that socioeconomic status um, has a very strong relationship with executive functioning in the US. This is from a meta-analysis. It's a little hard to read this. This is from Martha Farah's lab um, a couple years back. But what you see is that there's a consistent positive association between socioeconomic status and your executive functioning, such that as your SDS goes up, and this is true actually across the entire income distribution. This is not an effect that's specific to poverty the better your executive functioning. Um, so what we've been curious about is whether, you know, sort of consistent with this deprivation model, that these differences, these social gradients in um, executive function as well as brain development might be explained by the amount of cognitive and social stimulation that kids are receiving in their early environment. So I'm going to show you some data from a study where um, we use this sort of measure of cognitive stimulation that sort of requires observation of the early environment. So we actually go into families' homes. Um, we ask parents a bunch of questions. We actually make observations of that environment. How many books are around? Um, how, you know, how many toys does the kid have access to? What does the environment look like? Um, how often does the kid eat meals with a parent? How often do they leave the house for activities? How involved is the parent in the child's learning? Um, how much scaffolding is there of that early learning? Um, and what we see is um, sort of replicating some old work that showed the same pattern is that you get a very sort of clear relationship between SES and the amount of cognitive stimulation in the environment environment, such that as your SES goes up, sort of across the entire distribution, the amount of social and cognitive stimulation that kids tend to receive in that early environment also goes up. Um, and the amount of cognitive stimulation is an even stronger predictor of your executive functioning than your SES. So we see very consistently across tasks assessing working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility that as the cognitive stimulation in your early environment goes up, your performance on these executive functioning tasks also goes up.
Uh, what's really interesting is that we also see this pattern in, um, in association with cortical thickness, particularly in the frontoparietal network that we know underlies many of these executive functions. So when we look at cortical thickness in the middle frontal gyrus and the intraparietal sulcus, two regions that are sort of key nodes in this network, we find the same association, that higher cognitive stimulation is associated with greater cortical thickness in these regions. Um, and finally, sort of consistent with this model, we see that the relationship between um, of SES with both executive functioning and patterns of cortical thickness is mediated by the amount of cognitive stimulation that kids are receiving in their early environment. And we think this is important because, at least politically in our country, we can't change this. Although Kim Noble and um, others are leading, you know, a transformative landmark study that is attempting to do exactly that by giving families income supplements to see if it changes patterns of brain development and cognitive development. So we will soon see if you know, changing SVS changes these patterns. Um, but what we can do in the meantime um, is intervene here, right? Cognitive stimulation is a modifiable factor um, that could per, you know, be an important target for interventions aimed at reducing these disparities and disparities ultimately in sort of academic achievement that we know are related to these differences in, in cognitive and neural development. Um, okay, so I'm going to end by just, um, in the same way I did for threat, um, talking about the specificity of this pattern deprivation. So the first thing that I'm going to show you, this is data from the um, Philadelphia Neuroimaging and Genetics cohort. This is not data from my lab, but I like to show it. This is a sample of almost 10,000 kids. This is a paper um, published by Raquel Gurr um, this year that we've replicated in many smaller samples in my lab. Um, they're looking at a range of sort of cognitive um, uh, tests in that sample, including executive functions here. Um, what you see is the same pattern I showed you, this big difference as a function of SES. Um, and what they saw in that study, which had a high level of kids exposed to trauma, um, is no differences whatsoever in executive functions when they're measured in sort of a cold cognitive neutral domain among kids exposed to trauma. And this is a pattern we see very consistently in my lab, especially when we control for exposure um, to deprivation. In terms of these patterns of thinning in the, pre, in the frontoparietal network in the systematic review I mentioned to you earlier, um, we see in 100% of studies that have looked at kids exposed to deprivation, um, differences in either the volume or the thickness of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in a minority of studies of kids exposed to threat. Um, and even more consistent patterns when we look at um, patterns of structure in the um, superior parietal cortex, where 100% of studies that have studied kids exposed to deprivation find this pattern and no studies of kids exposed to threat do, suggesting that this pattern of exaggerated thinning um, is specific to deprivation and not to trauma. Okay, so to summarize, um, I've shown you that kids exposed to deprivation exhibit kind of persistent changes in cognitive and neural development, um, particularly in networks that support higher order cognitive abilities like the frontoparietal network. We see kind of widespread reductions in cortical thickness throughout the brain, but particularly in networks that support sort of higher order cognitive abilities. Um, differences in executive functioning. Um, I didn't show you this data, but we re re consistently see differences or reductions in frontoparietal recruitment during um, executive functioning tasks when we do them in the scanner and that consistently across each of these cognitive and neural domains that these differences as a, that as a function of deprivation are explained by the amount of social and cognitive stimulation that kids experience in their early environment. And that these patterns are generally not observed in kids who are exposed to trauma, particularly when we control for their co-occurring exposure to deprivation. Um, so in just like one minute, I'm going to show you one final um, domain that we've been interested in, which is um, how these different types of early experiences might influence the pace of development. Now, what I'm going to say is we are not, I'm not going to show you brain data here. So, so I'm not going to focus on some of the um, sort of the work that Dylan and Nim have done, which we really see as a very complementary model of how certain forms of adversity might impact the way the brain is developing by shifting kind of the pace of development in certain networks. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on more global metrics of development that sort of come out of these evolutionary models like Jay Belsky's work on how the sort of early environment um, sends a signal um, that can impact sort of life history strategies that influence how quickly you get to reproductive maturity, so the age of pubertal timing, um, as well as markers of sort of cellular and biological aging um, that we can look at um, more peripherally. Um, so this is work that's led by a postdoc in my lab named Natalie Kolick. Um, and in an initial study, we were interested in how sort of experiences in threat of threat and deprivation might have different influences on pubertal development, with the idea that growing up in a threatening environment sends a really clear signal that 
the environment's dangerous. When we're thinking about the cost benefit of investing a lot early on um, to grow and to develop your brain before you hit reproductive maturity, it might make sense to sort of make a trade off. If the environment's really dangerous, and this is an argument people have made for decades in child development, um, you might sort of want to hurry up and get to puberty faster because you're not sure you're going to make it there to reproduce. So, uh, consistent with that idea, we see that the more trauma you're exposed to, the farther along you are in puberty relative to your age um, compared to your peers. Um, when we look at deprivation, interestingly, we see the opposite pattern, that kids who are exposed to deprivation actually seem to be getting to puberty later, um, with the idea that social and cognitive deprivation might be sending an important signal about the resources that are available to you or in your environment, that there's not a lot of resources around. You want to sort of slow down, take advantage of what you can, and not hurry up to get to, to reproductive fitness, because reproductive fitness is energetically quite costly for the body and for the brain. So this was in a sample of about 250 kids in my lab. We then replicated this in a nationally representative sample where we simply looked at the age when girls reached um, uh, menarche. Um, and what you can see here is that as exposure to trauma goes up, the average age of menarche goes down, such that kids with higher levels of trauma are, getting, um, are hitting age of menarche earlier. Um, we see the opposite pattern in kids exposed to deprivation. Again, we see this sort of later, um, later onset of pubertal developments um, in those children. And finally, when we looked at a metric of cellular aging, um, particularly this new sort of metric of epigenetic aging, um, which is sort of a, um, I'm happy to talk about in more detail, but is sort of this epigenetic clock that can tell you at a cellular level sort of how old your cells are relative to your chronological age. And what we see again is that exposure to trauma is predicting accelerated um, epigenetic aging um, relative to your chronological age, and we find no association um, with deprivation. So these are all sort of studies that we did in my lab. Um, okay, done a, a meta-analysis, which is not quite out yet, um, but where we see across many studies that have looked at these associations, the same pattern. This is in nearly 60,000 subjects. We see across many studies, in general, kids who are exposed to trauma are exhibiting an acceleration in their reproductive development at the age at which they get to puberty. Um, children exposed to deprivation, this is not significantly different than zero, although it is in the opposite direction, seem to be getting to puberty later, although not statistically different from zero here. Pattern um, we observe for cellular aging. Now, there's many fewer studies here, so, you know, caution is warranted. Uh, but we see the same pattern, an acceleration in sort of cellular aging among kids exposed to trauma, and no difference in kids exposed to deprivation. Um, I'm going to skip that in the sake of time. Um, and simply say, of course, there are some mechanisms that are common across different forms of adversity. The argument isn't that these experiences have no shared effects. There's a long history of research on HPA axis development, sympathetic nervous system development, where there are common mechanisms that are affected by many kinds of adversity. Our argument is that not all of the mechanisms are identical and that there is some specificity and that's important for when we're thinking about intervention. I'll just go back to this slide for a minute. So yes, I think it's a great question. What I would say in general is that um, what we know, what we do know about sensitive periods in sort of cognitive and neural development that have come from studies of language and other exposures that are pretty well defined is that they actually happen pretty early in life, right? And that when we look at the effects of cognitive stimulation, for example, on things like executive functions, when you look across the literature, the, those effects are most consistently observed in sort of like zero to five, seven, you know, that that early, early environment seems to be having the most pronounced effect on, on cognitive systems. So what I would say is that if we want to intervene on something like cognitive simulation, the amount of language exposure kids have, which is a side note, lots of people are doing now. That now that these linguistic effects have been really well replicated, lots of people are trying to design interventions that sort of expose kids to more language early on. Um, I would argue that needs to happen probably pretty early. Um, when it comes to trauma, I'm actually, less sure about whether we can even apply a sensitive period model to that exposure, right? So when we think about deprivation, right? Sensitive periods are inherently periods of time when the brain is expecting a certain type of input from the environment, so when it doesn't get it, you know, that neural system is gonna be sort of developed in a really different way. Um, I'm not sure there is a sensitive period when the brain expects to experience threat. There could be. I mean, this you know, environment in which we evolved is very different than the environment we're in now, where threats probably were more common, but at least so far, we don't really have strong evidence that there's kind of a sensitive window when trauma is worse. Trauma seems to be bad no matter when you experience it. It continues to be bad for you as an adult, right? So, um, so what we think in terms of trauma is that we may have more um, flexibility in terms of when interventions might be, um, might be helpful. 
one idea that people have, and so in terms of our model, we're sort of building our window of intervention just based on what we know about when psychosocial interventions that target some of the domains that we're interested in, like emotional reactivity and regulation, tend to be on average most effective for children. And that's kind of between the ages of eight and 16. So if you look at big meta-analyses of psychosocial interventions, those are the ages when they tend to be most effective for kids. So we're kind of starting there. Um, but what I'll say, it, this is speculative, although there's some increasing evidence emerging, um, that suggests that adolescence actually might be sort of, um, I don't want to call it a second window of sensitivity or a sensitive period, but it's certainly a window of increased neuroplasticity um, that, you know, when sort of in general in our evolutionary history, people were experiencing new environments. And so it would make a lot of sense for the brain to become more plastic in response to those environments. Um, and there's some evidence from Megan Gunner's lab specific to HPA axis that suggests that kids who are exposed to really extreme early adversity, but who are in a positive environment during adolescence, um, that you actually see almost complete remediation of the effects of that early environment on um, HPA axis functioning. They have three papers now that have replicated that across sort of different measures of HPA axis functioning. And in the um, uh, Bucharest Early Intervention Project, what's really interesting is that um, so that early intervention that I talked to you about, I didn't talk to you about it much because executive functioning is one of the domains where the intervention actually had absolutely no effect. It had many positive effects in many other domains of social and emotional functioning, but the kids who were randomized into that foster care intervention have had no differences in their executive functions than the kids who were randomized to stay, which was very surprising. However, now that the kids are adolescents, so our most recent round of data collection, the kids were 16, and what we see is that even after that very extreme form of deprivation, when the kids are in a positive environment in adolescence, so basically have high quality caregiving, for the first time we're seeing kind of remediation and the effects of that early deprivation on their executive functions such that you know there seems to be this kind of plasticity in response to experience that is heightened during adolescence um, at least in the domains of executive function and we've seen the same thing for re reward processing and i think that is really positive because you know one of the things that's challenging about early intervention is that before kids get into school it's really hard to, to know which kids require intervention, right? Who's, who's gonna notice? You know, little kids mostly spend time in their families, maybe if you're lucky in a, you know, in a daycare or a childcare environment, but you know, they don't really have a lot of interactions outside the family. So you first start to notice problems typically when they enter school. So if we're sort of focused on a model where everything's gotta be before the age of, the, age of five, it's kind of depressing and hard because you don't often know which kids could need intervention before that age. But this sort of, Heightened plasticity of adolescence, I think, provides sort of a real opportunity to think about intervening during that period when interventions might, you know, have sort of boosted effectiveness um, in terms of being able to remediate some of the long-term effects of, of early adversity. So we don't actually know if that's true, but I think it's an exciting possibility and one that I think a lot of people are very are very interested in pursuing right now. Yeah. 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 So it's a it's a great question, and um, the the model we have is a dimensional one, right? With the idea that as you sort of increase your exposure to threat, the frequency, the severity of that, you know, the effects are going to be qualitatively the same, but quantitatively more, right? So as your exposure increases, we expect the effects on these systems, the social information processing, emotional reactivity, and so on, um, to sort of scale with the severity and chronicity of that exposure. Um, so what I would say about sexual trauma and physical trauma is that they both share a common ingredient of being really threatening experiences where you know the environment is sending a really clear signal that things aren't safe and that you know your survival is sort of at risk however is that the only thing you know is that the only element in those experiences no and i would say you know just from my clinical work and working with kids who've been sexually abused there's there's a lot else that comes along with that that you don't often see in kids who are who are physically abused right so is threat the only ingredient of sexual trauma i don't know i don't think it is um, but we haven't really dug into sort of where are the most important differences be between kids with physical and, and sexual forms of trauma as we've been kind of focusing on their on their shared elements and how they might affect these kind of threat 
threat related processing systems. Um, but absolutely, I mean, I think just clinically, you observe a number of patterns in those kids that that you don't tend to see in kids who are physically abused, right? So those kids are much more likely to sexually um, assault other people. They have a lot of confusion about um, about sex, right? You're introduced to sex at an age when you're, you know, you, you don't really understand it. it. It really has sort of a pervasive effect on how kids think about that domain of functioning in ways that, you know, you don't see in kids who are physically abused. So. Yes, puberty studies. Yeah. Really important confounder, and yes, we control for it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just had a question, like zooming in on the like your learning findings in, in the context of threat. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering, like, to what extent do you think that that might be a potentially like adaptive kind of response to a threat environment? Because you could imagine, like, in a situation that's characterized by like constant threat, that like, mm -hmm. a false alarm is going to be. It, 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 that finding is kind of like. Yep. So like thinking that a false alarm might be more adaptive than, than like Absolutely. Parents. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Sorry, you were did you have more? No, no, that's pretty much it. It's just like, to what degree do you feel like that is something that's hurting people versus like you said, is there some adaptivity to that? Absolutely. I mean I think I I think that we can interpret all of these patterns as very um, very adaptive in terms of the short term, right? What the brain is doing is adapting to the environment that, that, that the child is in. And you can imagine if you're sort of in an environment where threat happens all the time and it's hard to predict when that threat happens or what the cues are that sort of predict something being threatening or not, that casting a wider net in terms of the kind of cues that you respond to would, would make a lot of sense, right? It also might make it harder for you to actually learn how to discriminate. And I think that in the short term, you can imagine that might be beneficial, but in the long term, it's probably not so helpful to be constantly sort of alarming to things that are, that are totally safe. And it can explain patterns that we see really consistently in kids who are exposed to trauma, like persistent fear in contexts where they've never experienced danger. Um, and that probably comes at a long-term cost, right, in terms of anxiety and sort of other long-term mental health outcomes. And so, you know, you can imagine that when you're in an environment where threat is all around you and it's very difficult to predict, it can make make it harder to sort of do that kind of learning and the kinds of tasks that we use. Is that adaptive probably in the short term, but I would argue in the long term, it probably comes at, um, at an important cost. Yeah. So I think somebody helped. Um, so with that, I'll end and just thanks for um, your attention and the invitation to be here today. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yep. It's a great question. Um, so there's two questions, right? One is about timing, and one is about their synergistic effects. Um, and what I'll say is that they're both questions we're deeply interested in and don't know a lot about, right? So first, I think everyone who studies early adversity has a sense that the timing of exposure matters a lot, right? Especially when you think about something like deprivation, where I'm making an argument about experience expectant mechanisms, which we know tend to happen during sensitive windows of development, when the brain is tuning in at particular times um, to sort of see what the environment is like. And I think our, our clearest example of this is language, right? So we know, you know, for example, that there are very clearly identified sensitive periods in language development during, you know, even just a few months, we know early in infancy between the ages of six and nine months, kids are tuning in to the sort of phonemes that exist in their, in their language. At the age of six months, kids can discriminate every phoneme of every language in the world. By the age of nine months, they can only discriminate the phonemes that happen, the sounds that happen in their native language. Um, so Pat Cole's done you know, brilliant work on this, and people in, in language have really identified these sensitive periods. So one would argue if our focus is on language, 
understanding the exposures that happen specifically in those sensitive windows of development are when we expect they're going to have the biggest and most lasting effects on brain development and on eventual you know, cognitive and emotional functioning. The problem is that for many domains of social and emotional functioning, language is a great example where the input is really well understood, we can measure it really well, and we know when those sensitive periods exist for many aspects of language development. For many other aspects of development, it's a huge question mark. We don't actually know when those sensitive windows exist, even in normative development. Um, so it's difficult to sort of figure out exactly when timing of exposure might be most important for something like threat-related processing or even you know, the presence of a sensitive and responsive caregiver. Um, we do know a little bit about that from studies of deprivation, kids raised in orphanages, but I I'll sort of put that to the side. The other thing I'll say about time of exposure is that aside from orphanage rearing, where it's very easy, you know exactly when the kid entered the orphanage and when they left, so timing of exposure can be measured very precisely. In studies of kids exposed to trauma, for example, it's just very difficult to measure that well, right? So first, you know, many, our sense is that early exposure probably matters a lot, but kids, you know, try asking somebody about exposure to trauma in their first five years of life, right? It's a very difficult to ask a child to accurately report on that, very difficult to ask parents, especially if parents are the perpetrators. And just in general, retrospective reporting about these kinds of complex experiences, you can generally get a sense of did they happen or not, but when they happened is much harder to reliably assess in, you know, in community-based samples. So it's something that I would say people are extremely interested in, but it's just a very difficult thing to, to measure well and to study um, in community-based samples. So um, yes, I think it matters a lot, but do we know how? Not yet, I would say, um, for many domains. Um, and then your second question was about um, interactions, exactly. So um, it's one that I think is a really important one. Um, and as sort of the initial studies that we've done on this model were really designed to kind of test the, our initial hypotheses about the sort of differences in the, in the developmental mechanisms that might be impacted by these kinds of experiences. And so we have not really recruited samples that are powered to test their interactions, except we've just finished a study that was designed to look at exactly that. So I showed you just a little bit of data from that study at the end of the section on threat that we're just beginning to analyze, um, where we will be looking at exactly that question. So when you have both forms of adversity, you know, do you see kind of a non-additive effect? And you know, one domain where I think this is likely um, could be potentially the case is sort of when you're exerting control, um, top-down control in an emotionally salient context, right? So we see this kind of primary effect of deprivation on frontal parietal networks and underlie executive functions. We see huge effects of threat exposure and these sort of salience processing bottom-up kind of emotional reactivity systems. Um, but we're often sort of recruiting those systems simultaneously. When we have a big emotional response that needs to be modulated based on the context that we're in, we're sort of using those executive functions to, you know, in the service of emotional control. And so that's one domain where you might expect exposure to both of these kinds of adversity is going to have sort of a non-additive effect where it's it's more it's like a double whammy right you're sort of hitting that system in, in two different ways that is likely going to have a really a big impact on something like emotion regulation abilities but um, it's a great question and one that we're sort of just beginning to to dive into yeah yeah thanks Yep. Yeah, yeah. On the same lab, and we've recently, various forms of psychopathology that we measured, this also predicts the P factor, the general psychopathology factor, and on the x-axis here, you can't read that, but this is their, um, the degree of functional connectivity we see between the amygdala and the hippocampus. Lower scores um, are on the left, those were scores that were more typical of kids who'd been exposed to trauma. Scores on the right are kids, uh, scores that were more typical of kids who had never experienced trauma. And what you see very consistently is that the less crosstalk that you have between the amygdala and the hippocampus, the higher your levels of psychopathology, not only concurrently, but also two years later. Um, so again, suggesting that this sort of pattern of brain response during aversive learning could be a sort of mechanism that helps to explain this link between trauma um, and